Well, as you just heard, it looks like this compromise bill of the debt ceiling and some provisions on the ongoing spending at the federal level from Kevin McCarthy and Joe Biden, it looks like this bill is going to pass with Democrats' help. Uh, so what's the fallout? I mean, should Kevin McCarthy no longer be speaker? Is he going to face a revolt amongst Republicans? Was this an awful deal? Could he have done better? Well, politics is often called the art of the possible, right? But think about it. In a divided government where one side of the political debate insists on referring to his opponents as mega fascist extremists, there's not much that's really possible to achieve there, is there? And that's precisely what Speaker of the House Kevin McCarthy has been facing for the past several months. He's tried in vain to have a meaningful negotiation with Joe Biden, a man with no fundamental guiding political philosophy other than to demonize and destroy anyone who stands in the way of his political or his family's financial fortunes. Don't believe me? Think he's still just good old kindly Uncle Joe? Well, ask the families of Robert Bork or Clarence Thomas about good old kindly Uncle Joe. You've seen him in action. He's a mean old jerk. Now, depending on who you listen to in the Republican caucus of the House of Representatives, this debt ceiling compromise is either a turd sandwich, as Congressman Chip Roy of Texas colorfully called it, or it's the largest single reduction in federal spending in American history. That's what Representative Dusty Johnson of South Dakota called it right here on this program last night. You got to take a pick. This thing is either an abomination that's going to bankrupt America, or it's the second coming of the Reagan era. It's one or the other. It certainly can't be anything in between, right? We can't have that. Of course, that's probably what this deal actually is. It's exactly that. It's something in between. And the advocates on both sides of the compromise debate would, would serve their argument well if they just admitted that. Kevin McCarthy defied all the conventional wisdom in Washington. He wrangled his Republicans into passing a really great debt ceiling bill a little over a month ago. This bill had meaningful cuts. It had work requirements for welfare. It had border and immigration reforms. It had a rollback of now obsolete COVID pandemic funding. It was pretty damn good. Biden dared him to pass the bill and he did it. Now, McCarthy's brilliant political gamesmanship put Biden on his heels. He didn't know what to do. So he reneged on his stubborn insistence that there would be no negotiation at all on the debt ceiling issue. That's what he'd been saying since day one. No negotiation, no negotiation, no negotiation. Let's see what McCarthy has. Let's see his budget. Let's see him pass a bill. Well, he passed a bill. And suddenly, Mr. No Negotiation was negotiating. Kevin McCarthy forced Joe Biden to the table, and that was a victory in and of itself. But then Biden took a blowtorch to the entire proceedings. He continued to demonize MAGA Republicans. He falsely accused them of cutting border protection. Yes, that's right. He claimed that Republicans were cutting border protections. Border protection that is non-existent right now, by the way. They accused them of cutting veterans benefits. And he accused them of helping wealthy tax cheats and crypto traders. Those are his words. He was lying. He then threatened to invoke a Civil War era 14th Amendment provision on paying debts in a desperate attempt to flex his authoritarian impulses and circumvent Congress and the Constitution altogether. It, it never would have worked. It never would have happened. He probably never would have done it. But that's who Kevin McCarthy was negotiating with. In other words, McCarthy was negotiating with a lying, duplicitous kamikaze pilot who was more than willing to crash his jet into the nation's economy. Why? Because he knows that the compliant national media would blame House Republicans, even though House Republicans were literally the only political entity in Washington, D.C. acting responsibly and constitutionally over the past five months. They were the only ones doing anything. Now, Anyone who tells you that Joe Biden and his noxious cohorts in the Democratic Party would have reasonably accommodated any real reforms in the federal budget at the end of this process is either lying to you or they're naive. Biden wasn't going to budge. 
Biden doesn't care about a looming default. He doesn't care about spending money that our great-grandchildren don't have. Biden doesn't care about any political ramifications of the stalemate. I mean, think about it. Biden is already at rock bottom in popularity. He's got an approval rating of like 33% right now. Oh, you may suffer politically, Mr. President, if you go further. How is he going to suffer anymore? 33%? Those are people who are barely paying attention anyway. He had nothing to lose in this. He's already the most unpopular president at this time in his presidency in history. And he rightly anticipated that every major newspaper, every major network, every major talking head in this town would take his side. If we defaulted at the end of the day, they would blame McCarthy, they would blame Trump, they would blame DeSantis, they would blame Reagan, they would blame me. They would blame anyone they could. And by the way, it would probably stick with a lot of voters who aren't paying attention. Oh my gosh, for the first time ever, we've defaulted on our debt. Why did this happen? Well, because you let those Republicans in the House of Representatives have the majority. Nancy Pelosi wouldn't have let this happen. So how do you practice the art of the possible when both sides aren't acting in good faith? How do you represent the majority in the House of Representatives when you've got a president who refuses to acknowledge the majority party as even a legitimate political voice? How do you hang an or else over your counterpart's head in a negotiation when they have literally no fear of any fallout from the circumstances that may develop from that or else? Kevin McCarthy recognized the situation he was in, and he probably got the best possible deal he could muster in a nearly impossible situation. So here's the problem. Why doesn't he just say that? Forget the art of the possible. Let's try the art of the plausible for a moment. Because right now, what McCarthy and Republicans who like this bill, what they're saying about it is not plausible. They should be frank. Tell it like it is. Don't try to sell us that this is a great deal and we should be celebrating it. It's not. And we know it's not. Give Republican voters the respect we deserve. Here's what Kevin McCarthy should do. He should hold a press conference when this thing passes. He should hold a press conference. He should say, listen, I was negotiating with an obstinate, reckless, semi-coherent authoritarian who has no respect for the constitutional role of Congress or the people's wishes from the 2022 midterms. He has no respect for the process. He has no respect for voters who ripped the speaker's gavel from the clutches of his party last November. He does nothing but insult Republicans and the Americans who voted for us into the majority. And yet, despite the impossibility of dealing with this selfish narcissist in chief, we actually got a few things. We didn't get everything we wanted, but we got something. We, we maintained the defense spending. We pulled back unspent COVID relief money. We, we brought non-defense spending back to last year's levels. We raised the debt ceiling until months after the next presidential election. That way, our Republican nominee can run on this issue next year. He can promise the American people to fix this once and for all after they win in November. No, this is not a great bill. Hell, this is not even a good bill, but it's something. And it's a hell of a lot better than Biden ever intended on giving us. So let's pass this thing, begin the budget and appropriations process for next fiscal year, where we actually have some control over the purse strings, and let's set this issue up as the top priority for our nominee in next year's election. That's what Kevin McCarthy should tell us. Now, that would be an honest assessment of where we are right now. It's a plausible description of what we're dealing with. We'd appreciate plausible right about now. Stop telling us about how this is the greatest anything in the history of any place, anywhere, anytime, because it's not. It's also not a, a turd sandwich. It's a mediocre compromise that doesn't accomplish a whole lot, but it does move us forward to the next battle. And, and that's okay for now. There's more to come on O'Connor tonight. Keep it here. You're watching Salem News Channel.